Well, in Pastor Janet's uh, fashion, I'm going to start with a couple jokes this morning. One is about um, palm branches and one is about a donkey. A little boy was sick on Palm Sunday and he stayed home with, from church with his mother. When his father came home from church, he was carrying a palm branch. And the boy said, why are you carrying that? Well, you see, said his father, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches, palm branches to honor him. So we got palm branches in church today. The boy responded, ah, shucks. The one Sunday I miss is the Sunday that Jesus shows up. <laughs> the other one is maybe a true story. I don't know. The person was Lloyd George was a prime minister uh, of United Kingdom during uh, the second half of World War II. One day when Lloyd George was making a political speech to a very large crowd, a heckler stood up and said, wait a minute, Mr. George, isn't it true your grandfather used to peddle tinware with an ox cart and a donkey? Lloyd George replied, I digress just a moment and thank the gentleman for calling that to my attention. It's true, my dear old grandfather used to peddle tinware with an old cart and donkey. As a matter of fact, after this meeting is over, my friend can come with me and I'll show him that old cart. But I never knew until this minute what happened to that donkey. <laughs> it was Passover time in Jerusalem and thousands of Jews poured into the city for the biggest religious event of the year. They came with joy. This was a big event. Passover was when the Jews remembered the miraculous escape from slavery in Egypt. On that night, God told his people to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on the door frame so that the angel of death would pass over them when it came through the Egyptian streets. And the next morning, the whole contingency of Jews made their escape across the Red Sea. And for Jews, Passover is still a very special time to celebrate this delivery. I wish I could have been in Jerusalem that day. After years of keeping his identity quiet, Jesus himself planned every detail of the parade that would put him square in the, in the limelight. He arranged ahead for the loan of a donkey. He planned the parade on a route where Passover pilgrims streamed into the city and could easily be drawn into the parade line. Oddly, Jesus knew that the religious leaders were looking for a reason to kill him. So why did he plan the parade in such a public venue? The prophet Zechariah predicted this parade See, your king comes, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. Riding on a small donkey that had, had never been sat on before was an ancient sign symbolizing a call to peace after conquest. It didn't fit with the age-old expectation that the Messiah would come as a politically powerful military presence against Rome. There must have been many different reactions to the parade of celebration. Some knew who Jesus was and they thought finally Jesus is getting the attention he deserves. Some got caught up on the in the activity but they had no clue why this man was so special. Others walked away wondering what was the hullabaloo about this so-called Messiah. Others laid down their garments and palm branches as a way to honor him. And then there were those who were politically savvy. They knew there might be some political repercussions of this and they didn't want to, be, to risk being pegged as Jesus' follower. The words of honor sung by these Passover pilgrims were powerful words. Hosanna was a song, a hymn of praise used for a leader, kind of like, Hail to the Chief. Some shouted, Hosanna to the Son of God, acknowledging a messianic connection. And the word was also an Aramaic word for help, which meant 
save now, we pray. David Albert Farmer says, the crowds were looking for dramatic displays of power, but the methods of Jesus' power were contrary to what they thought this world needed. His methods were humility, self-sacrifice, suffering, suffering love, absolute obedience to God and God's standards. And what they least understood was his love for all people, regardless of their regard for him. Many in the crowd were not really yelling, hooray for Jesus. They were really saying, down with Rome. I wonder, would the consequences of Holy Week been the same if Jesus had come into Jerusalem quietly? What gave him the courage to do it? First, he had tremendous trust in his father. And second, he believed in a higher purpose. It was not about him anymore. It was about the redemption of the world. Which reminds me of a story about Christopher, not mine. The name means Christ bearer. The Christ bearer of Palm Sunday was the small donkey who had never been ridden before. The day after parade, the donkey woke up savoring yesterday's excitement and thinking he could go out and draw that attention again. He stopped at a well where people were drawing water. He stood up straight and tall, but they paid no attention to him. Throw down your garments, he said crossly. Don't you know who I am? And they stared at him, and somebody slapped him on the rump. Heathens, he muttered. I'll go to the marketplace where the good people are. They will remember me. But the same thing happened. Where are the palm branches? You threw palm branches yesterday. But nothing. Hurt and confused, the donkey returned home. Foolish child, his mother said. Don't you realize that without Jesus, you're just an ordinary donkey? Like the donkey, Jesus' triumph turned from te cheers to tears. Tony Cartledge says, the problem with palms is that once you cut them off the tree, they don't live long. The problem with Palm Sunday is that the excitement of the crowd soon faded and when Good Friday rolled around, many of the same voices who sh shouted Hosanna were shouting, crucify him. Their love for the Lord was shallow and based entirely on their hope of what exciting things he could do for them. As the parade moved through Jerusalem, the sight of the city moved Jesus to tears. In fact, the words that the text uses mean heartbreaking sobs. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he said, if only you knew the things that make for peace. Jesus knew that he was Israel's last best hope for personal and national salvation. The Jews used the word shalom for peace. We all know that. It means more than the absence of conflict. Shalom is the interior peace with God that spills over into peace with people and with nations. We reveal who we are, says Brett Blair. It is by our interactions with others that we paint stroke by stroke the portrait of who we are. We have grown accustomed that Palm Sunday is a celebration to honor Jesus Christ, our heavenly King, but Jesus did not look out among the branches and see the faithful. He looked out among the palms and saw what he had seen for the last three years. A people whose understanding was dim and whose hearts were filled with malice and vengeance toward Rome. Their voices shouted Hosanna, but their hearts beat with a bloody desire for war. And less than three decades later, Jewish militants battled against Rome. The resounding defeat left Jerusalem completely de devastated that as Jesus predicted, not one stone was left on top of another. Well, actually, a small section of the temple wall is still standing, now known as the Western 
or the Wailing Wall. I saw that spot. It's considered a holy spot by many because it was closest to where the Holy of Holies had been located. People still come there. I saw them rocking back and forth in great anguish. I saw them putting their written prayers in the crevices of the wall, maybe hoping to got, get God's ongoing attention. The question I pose this morning is, what would our response be on Palm Sunday and on Good Friday? Would we cheer enthusiastically or just be swept along with the crowd? Would we hang back, afraid to be pegged as Jesus' follower? Would our response change from Sunday to Friday? David Farmer notes, the disciples were some of the first and ardent believers of Jesus' role as Savior. Yet the disciples were also some of the first to lose heart when it became clear what kind of Messiah Jesus would be. They believed that the cross meant defeat. Cheering for Jesus is in order. The Pharisees wanted the noise to stop, but Jesus said, if the crowd stops cheering, the stones will cry out, because today I am revealed for who I really am. In other words, there is something to cheer about. We must cheer in recognition of God's greatness and power to mend broken lives and resurrect dead hopes. We must cheer because God enables us to live with dignity and purpose and wholeness. We must cheer to express appreciation for what Christ has done among us and offer him our spirit of, of commitment. In a sermon by Martin Luther King, he said, crowd pressures have unconsciously conditioned our minds and feet to move to the rhythmic drumbeat of the status quo. Many voices and forces urge us to choose the path of least resistance and never to fight for an unpopular cause, cause never to be found in a minority of two or three. Some of you will remember the classic novel, The Robe, by Lloyd Douglas. A Roman soldier named Marcellus became enamored with Jesus. He wrote letters to his fiancée back in Rome telling her about Jesus' teachings and miracles and then later about his crucifixion and resurrection. Finally, he informed her he had decided to become a disciple of Jesus. In her letter of response, Diana said, what I feared was that it might affect you. It's a beautiful story. Let it remain so. We don't have to do anything about it, do we? Only God, God forbid that our faith and responses to Jesus are so detached. Team Spirit often talks about how to encourage active faith at Creekside, and it was the reason for providing the spiritual friendship opportunities this Lent. It was a goal for starting the spiritual direction group. It's demonstrated when we share our faith together in Sunday school classes or in community outreach. Let's be disciples who do something because we know what Jesus did for us. Our spiritual health depends on it, on letting the story of Jesus affect us. From Sunday to Friday, the question changes from what's worth cheering for to what's worth dying for. And the questions I've prepared for you to consider this week are what events to you are worth cheering for? And if you were in Jerusalem that, watching that parade on Palm Sunday, how would you have responded? With joy or reservation? With fear or disinterest? How does the story of Jesus affect you?